A superfluid is a form of matter where you have motion in the superfluid without viscosity, without friction. So you can imagine if you have a superfluid cup of coffee and you take a spoon and stir up the coffee and take the spoon out, the liquid will go in a circle for hours, for days, for months, as long as you maintain the superfluid state. This would be weird. We haven't seen that with a cup of coffee, but this is what happens at ultra low temperature. This is what happens in the quantum world. So superfluidity, it has the word super in it, is a very interesting property which has attracted uh, the attention of physicists uh, for many, many years. Uh, until the advent of ultra cold gases, superfluidity was only studied in one element, in helium in the form of superfluidity of helium-4 and the superfluidity of helium-3. Helium-3 is a fermion, so the superfluidity in helium-3 happens at millikelvin temperature, whereas for helium-4 it happens at around 2 Kelvin. Now, Bose-Einstein condensates are a new form of matter which is a gaseous superfluid, a superfluid which is very dilute and it has such low densities that it is a gas. The Bose-Einstein condensate as a gas has a density which is uh, a billion times more dilute than superfluid helium. It's also about a million times more dilute than air at atmospheric conditions. So we're talking about very, very dilute gases. What makes it interesting is that very dilute gases are simple to describe, simple to understand. So we have uh, many different possibilities to learn something about superfluidity and test superfluidity using ultra-cold gases. Let me come back to the concept of why are Bose-Einstein condensates superfluid. In a Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, most of the particles are in one quantum state, behave as one wave, or, to use a metaphor, march in lockstep. So this helps you to understand why a Bose-Einstein condensate is superfluid. Assume that uh, you go to a crowded space and people walk kind of randomly. They run into each other, they bump into each other. There is lots of friction. And if you want to cross a street and there are many, many people in the street, it can take forever. But now imagine all the people march in lockstep. If all the people march in lockstep, there is no friction, there is no elbowing anymore, and all the people can quickly cross the street because they are all walking together. So marching in lockstep, being one wave, is actually deeply related to superfluid behavior. In certain limiting cases, it's even identical to superfluidity. So this is why when we create a Bose-Einstein condensate, where particles march in lockstep, we have created a superfluid gas. The interesting part about it is that it's a gas, it's not a fluid, and gases are much easier to understand than fluids. In a gas, particles are isolated, and all you have to know is how particles collide, how particles interact. If you try to understand a liquid, well, in a liquid, particles are squeezed against each other, the properties of particles are modified, and it's very difficult to have a first principle description of a liquid, whereas for gases, you know what the equations are. So Bose-Einstein condensation put us in a position to now separate the superfluid state from the more complicated equations describing a liquid. So we had what you can regard a pure superfluid, a system where superfluidity was dominant and not kind of all the interaction effects which people had to take into account in the superfluids which had existed until then. If you have a gas of bosonic particles and we cool them down, they form a Bose-Einstein condensate. However, for fermions, this is not possible. The Pauli exclusion principle does not allow two fermions to be in the same quantum state. So therefore, they cannot all go into one quantum state as the bosons in the Bose-Einstein condensate. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible to have a Bose-Einstein condensate of fermions. What we have to do is we first have to form pairs of fermions. Two fermions as a pair are now a composite boson.
Fermions are particles which have an odd number of constituents in the form of protons, neutrons and electrons. Bosons have an even number and if you take two fermions together, a pair of fermions, they always have an even number of constituents. And that's why fermion pairs are always bosons. So now uh, when fermions pair, then they can achieve superfluidity in the form of Bose-Einstein condensation of atom pairs. And eventually this was also achieved in our field. Uh, in my group and other groups we have studied the superfluidity of fermionic atoms and the important step was before the fermions could become superfluid they had to pair up spin up and a spin down particle or particles in two different quantum states had to form a pair. The interesting part of that is that this is almost exactly the mechanism which creates superconductors. Superconductivity in, in materials has important applications because superconductors can transmit electrical power without any losses and superconductors are used to build the world's most powerful magnets. The mechanism of superconductors is similar to superfluidity or to say it in this way what uh, a neutral particles are superfluid, but if the particles are charged, we call them superconductivity. So superconductivity is nothing else than superfluidity of charged particles. So superconductor have many practical applications, but it's not yet fully understood how they all work. And the mystery is sometimes about how do two electrons pair up, form a pair of fermions, and then they can become superconducting. Now, using ultra-cold atoms, we are studying the pair formation, how two fermionic atoms form a pair and become superfluid. So in that sense, if we study the superfluidity of fermionic atoms, we contribute to a better understanding of superconductivity. And one of our dreams is that we can do a quantum simulation of high TC superconductors, that we try to build a model of uh, a system uh, of fermionic atoms where we would put in what people think is the mechanism for high TC superconductors and validate those ideas or maybe show that the ideas people have about high TC superconductors are not sufficient to explain the mechanism. So what are the prospects of doing a quantum simulation of high TC superconductors? Well, people have made clear predictions. Take fermionic atoms, put them in an optical lattice, adjust the density and the forces between atoms in such and such a way, and you should get superfluidity, which is analogous to high TC superconductors. We would like to try that. We would like to quantum simulate this system and show whether the concepts are correct, whether they lead to superfluidity, or whether it's insufficient to achieve superfluidity. There is no proof whether those theoretical ideas are correct. So therefore we would like to do a quantum simulation. However, we are currently not yet able to do that because the predicted transition temperature to superfluidity are lower than the, te than the temperatures we currently accomplish. So my research on ultra-cold atoms wants to contribute to deeper understanding of materials, uh, to deeper understanding of what forms of matter are possible in nature. If this research would provide a deeper understanding of superconductors and then people in 10, 20 or 30 years would create a room temperature superconductor, I would be very, very happy. Then my work would have an enormous impact on science and technology because there is no question that a room temperature superconductor will change the world. Room temperature superconductors mean we can transmit power across continents without any losses. We can build more powerful magnets, uh, powerful motors, and it's just open to imagination what would happen if you have superconductors in your iPhones. <laughs>